What he meant to say in there was he's sorry for criticizing you. I may, may not have come Did there. I say that? Did I, not, did, no. I, did I not say the word sorry? <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Borg's Next Level Sunday podcast. I'm your host, Tim Miller. It's another special gay pride edition. All gays. Uh, I am lucky to be here with my bestie, Sarah Longwell, and the only lesbian, full lesbian, I guess, Kristen Cinema, half halfway there, uh, in the Senate, Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin. Thank you so much for taking the time, Senator. I'm delighted to. Happy Pride. Um, Sarah, I want to put you on the spot here. You have a little story. You guys have a connection um, that, that maybe the senator might not be aware of. Oh, well, certainly she remembers the time that we met back in 2012. Uh, because certainly. I, certainly. Uh, at a... I try to. I, well, I don't know if it was actually a gay event, uh, but it was when you were first running for senator, and I came, and I was, you know, you may know this about Tim, but we were both active Republicans in those days, and so you were the very first Democrat. I introduced myself to you, and I said you're the first Democrat I've ever donated to, uh, and I was very excited uh, about there being a lesbian potentially who could win a Senate seat, and. Uh, now I give to Democrats all the time because I because uh, then Trump happened. But it was a real novelty when we first met. Um, so it's great to see how how far you've come since then. You might then. remember because do you ever do you hear from many lesbian Republicans that donated to you? I mean, that's <laughs> got to be a pretty short list. I, I do know a few, uh, but not <laughs> not a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us. Um, Senator, I want to start, I listened to a couple of your other podcasts, and I got to tell you, I was pretty well uh, briefed on your political life, um, but I was kind of surprised a little bit about your origin story, if you will. So I was just wondering, maybe you'd share that with some of our listeners who are in my boat, who didn't know kind of about your childhood and health issues growing up in Wisconsin. And, sure. And I, I'd love just to hear a little, you know, just give us the a little nickel tour of your, <laughs> of your youth in Wisconsin. Absolutely. So I was... Uh born in Madison, Wisconsin, raised by my maternal grandparents. Um, uh, my mother struggled with uh, uh, both mental illness and physical illness, and I was so very fortunate that my grandparents were there for me. Um, my grandfather was a professor at the University of Wisconsin. My grandmother thought she was an empty nester uh, with her, both of her daughters, you know, out of, out of the home, and she had gone uh, to work at the university also um, managing the costume uh, lab at the theater department and teaching a lot of courses, et cetera. So I kind of, um, I, I, I have these childhood images of being at my grandfather's laboratory. Uh, he was a biochemist and then my grandmother's costume lab, a very different type of laboratory, if you will. Um, but you're right. The, um, one of the um, formative uh, uh, things in my early life was a very serious childhood illness at age nine. And I was in the hospital for three months. Um, and my grandparents had insurance, um, a, a, but I uh, didn't, didn't cover grandchildren. You know, you're not a legal dependent. Uh, and, um, and then uh, as I uh, got better, fully recovered, uh, they said, let's fix this. Let's get our health insurance. And, you know, back then, if you were somebody with a pre-existing health condition, no insurance company had to cover you. And so I, I basically, they couldn't find any insurance at any price. And so it wasn't until I was in college that I had uh, a, a policy, a health policy. Um, but I also, it was a uh, formative also in the way that I just felt that was wrong when I actually learned the story. Because I can tell you when I was sick, my grandparents did not burden me with their worries. Um they were just there rallying by my side. But it, it, it became the issue that um, uh, convinced me, I, I want to change, uh, I want to change things. And I want to have a role in, in changing um, healthcare policy. And so uh, that's what brought me to public service. And uh, first, the county board, which believe it or not, actually dealt with some health policies back in the day. And, uh, and then this progression from state level to national level office where I've been able to, I think, make a real difference on that particular issue. You know, when I was reading your bio, I was struck by the fact that you basically went, what, you went to college, uh, Smith, by the way, which is like pretty on the nose, uh, and then, uh, and then, and then went to law school and then immediately ran for office, right? There was like, you knew, was there any time in between? <laughs> um, so, uh, 
yeah, I took like a gap year between college and um, and law school. And I was actually, uh, the jobs that I had were in state government. I was working uh, in the governor's office and working on the issue of pay equity, equal pay for equal work, uh, uh, which there were some local initiatives to get um, get the house in order, both in, in state government, but also uh, at local government. And I was, I just remember this so vividly. I was a first year law student and my county board uh, 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 representative announced that she was going to retire. Now I'm living right on campus at the time. Um, and so when, when I say retire, she was like in her mid twenties and didn't want to live on campus anymore after she had graduated. <laughs> so, so anyways, um, I was like, oh, wow, there's a real opportunity here. And I remember uh, talking to one of my professors um, and uh, saying that I was thinking about this and gave me this really stern look. He said, you know, you could be a great lawyer if you applied yourself. And then there was this silence and then this twinkle in his eye. And he said, but if you insist on running for county board, you'll have my full support. And I was like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. yes. um, <laughs> apply, apply yourself. <laughs> um, so, so I... Oh my gosh, I was. Uh, it's not exactly like you're trying to take a job as a professional video game player or something. <laughs> right. I mean, it was still the county board, not nothing, yeah. you know, not lawyering. You I know, guess this, this professor um, it had a real, uh, real impact on me. He was my, um, you know, when you're in law school, there are all these large lecture courses, but they try to give you one small course. So he was my small group professor, civil procedure, and uh, but he had in his day. Um, I'd uh, done an internship in a U.S. Senator's office. I, mean, I wasn't talking about running for U.S. Senate, by the way. I was talking about running for county board. Um, but he had the bug, and he absolutely understood why I was passionate about it and, and was very encouraging. Okay, well, before we get into politics, I want to I want to continue down the you know first date path here a little bit. And um, anybody that's been on a gay first date knows that you've got to cover this. So... Uh, you were coming out in Wisconsin in what the early eighties? I, I how did that go? How did your family take that? Or maybe late eighties? I don't. I don't. I don't want to yeah. imp improperly age you, but so so before before it was quite common, I would think, um, in Wisconsin. So talk, talk, just talk about that experience. Yeah. So I came out while I was in college, um, junior year. I uh, kind of had super big crush. Uh, sort of fell in love for the first time. And so, um, you know, as, as you heard, I went to college out of state, uh, Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, and um, but always knew that I was coming home um, after college because um, my grandparents um, who raised me, they were advancing in years. In fact, my grandfather passed away between my junior and senior year of college, and I wanted to be back in Madison, Wisconsin to be with my grandmother um, in case she needed me. Turns out she didn't really need me for many, many years. She was uh, you know, uh, feisty, independent, uh, very healthy, but, but I needed, I felt I needed to come back home. And so, um, you know, so coming out to her and coming out to, um, all of my high school friends who, um, you know, I was away when I was coming out and wasn't telling them in real time. So sitting down with each of them, um, I couldn't be, uh, more fortunate with the reaction that I got. The one friend who was really mad at me was just mad at me for not telling her earlier. Like, what yeah. what is wait, what's this about um coming out to my mother uh sarah was that person for me actually <laughs> sarah was i was mad at me. i was she, mad at him. she got hurt she was upset she heard second in the office that was her big complaint absolutely <laughs> and and so i was i was very fortunate in and um i mean i i guess that means i i chose my friends well uh um but and and my mother was very supportive in fact my mother had more gay friends in madison than i did um which was just like um, but I didn't necessarily want to hang out with her gay friends. They were a generation Fair. older than me. Um, but, yeah. but all of that said, uh, you know, I, I did have that time where I was interested in um, politics, interested in um, potentially running for office and had that moment of, wow, can I actually do this if I'm out? Do I have to make a choice between right. being out or pursuing my aspirations, my my dreams, and um, there were um, uh, there were some people who had uh, 
broken that barrier in the um, in Wisconsin prior to that. And so as I was like exploring running for office and working on other people's campaigns, I met Dick Wagner, who is probably my uh, my foremost mentor. Um, he was already on the county board. There were two out people on the Dane County Board of Supervisors. This is in the mid 80s. With yeah, what year is this? Openly gay elected officials in the country. Um, and um, and I had to I got to have two mentors right on my county board. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I had a lot of support and, you know, answered that question. Do, do I have to make a choice between being out, um, or running for office? And it's like, no, I can do both and I can win. And that was, um, that was remarkable. Um, my, my, uh, uh Congressman Mark Pocan, who, uh, is an out gay man, uh, in Congress, um, he, he and I, he sort of followed uh, in my footsteps, I guess you could say. Um, we were both on the county board together, and then I ran for state legislature. He ran for my state assembly seat when I ran for Congress, um, and then he ran for my congressional seat when I ran for Senate. But I mentioned him because he was just reminding me the other day that there were more openly gay uh, people um, in office in Dane County, Wisconsin, in the late 80s than there were in the entire state of, of California. And you would think, you would wow. think that uh, yeah. maybe, you know, a state like California might have more openly gay elected officials. But yeah, I th we, we've been overtaken by, by California since then. But it was, a, it was a, an area, um, I, Madison, Wisconsin was a, a pretty special place in terms of, um, uh, you know, being forward thinking in terms of LGBTQ rights and um, policies and, um, and elected officials. So... I want to do a Parks and Recreation style <laughs> show on the gay Dane County uh, board of, of 1985. Was it 1994 that you proposed in the state legislature a, a gay marriage legalization bill? Is that right? It sounds mm -hmm. about right. We, what I um, we were working sort of on dual tracks of um, of marriage uh, marriage as well as looking at domestic partnership legislation. Um, yeah. And I, so Did I'm you not get some nasty letters back then, I would imagine. <laughs> yes, there were some, uh, but, um, but it was a really fascinating conversation. And, you know, certainly in 1996, when the Hawaii case was decided, um, it was, it really became something on people's radar screens. Um, you know, for, for most people, <laughs> sadly, it was about introducing legislation to prevent it from happening here. But um, but I was obviously leading an effort to talk about it uh, proactively and saying, look, we need the tools to um, protect our families. Uh, you know, when you think of marriage, so many people think of the ceremony. Um, but it's so important to recognize that um, when you get married, you, you are you then have available to you this set of legal tools that allows you to uh, protect your spouse, protect your children, um, and uh, and and without those tools, um, uh, you're certainly more vulnerable, as is your family. You know, Tim and I are both uh, in one of these newfangled gay marriages, um, and uh, <laughs> I gotta say. I came and you're along. Cur you're currently parenting on this podcast right now, am, so you I'm, might get to see the real deal here at some I point. Got, yeah, me and Nature Cat are doing the parenting right now. Uh, but one of the things, so when I uh, when I was in my uh, late twenties, I joined the Log Cabin Republicans because I wanted to get involved in you know marriage equality work and repealing "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." Um, and one of the things that happened was I was like the youngest person there. It was like mostly men who were in their 60s and 70s. And uh, one of the things that I I don't think gets talked about enough is like our generation, we got to get all of the good stuff from it. And we also got to be at the tail end of the activist class. Like we were there as like pushing things over the goal line. But you guys, the generation ahead of us, did like you guys took all the arrows. Like by the time we came along, there were love is love t shirts and you know, like, you know, we had all this all the celebrities were on board. You guys were fighting the fight when it was extremely hard and it was a super uphill battle. And I don't think that generations get thanked enough 
for what they did, how much work they put in and the personal risk that they took. Um, and so I just really appreciate it because we do now get yeah. to live that life that you imagined to take care of our families. I don't know. I was going to say that's sweet. I'm going to, you know, you don't have, yeah. it's sometimes awkward to be like, well, thank you. I am great. Um, but we do appreciate that. And thank you. I, I have a less sweet comment. Um, I, 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 I attacked you despite all your work as a, uh, you know, somebody that uh, was doing this way before I was comfortable doing it. Attacked is maybe an overstatement, but, but two years ago, or I guess last year when you were doing the respect for marriage act, updating this work that started in 19 in the mid 90s that now goes all the way to 2023 where this threat or 2022 where this threat is out there again you know maybe uh the, the wanting to shore out the possibility of the threat after the roe v wade decision i on strategic grounds was like that senator baldwin is being too nice to these republicans by letting them off the hook by letting them vote for this after the election. And, you know, we should jam it down their throats. And I've got my, the bitterness that I have about my former Republican friends. So I, I was curious, I, what I wanted to hear from you is kind of the that process, the strategic approach in 2022. Did you feel like you had the votes? Were there Republicans saying they'd only do it after the election? And, and mm -hmm. you know, did that end up being harder or easier than you thought? I, I just would like your impressions from that. You know, yeah. kind of debate last year because it was a big, it was a big bipartisan win on a list of them that that Biden doesn't yeah. get enough credit for. It, it was. Um, I mean, you've you uh, you you pointed out the the reality there. Um, I I felt uh, confident that we had the votes, um, but there are procedure. You know, the Senate, all the procedure, etc. Um, I was told uh, very clearly that uh, we would not have the votes to get onto the bill um, uh, if we brought it up before the election. Um, so some of the same people who said they would be voting for it said, I will not vote to advance onto the bill for debate if you have this vote before the election. And uh, like, okay, but when we bring it up, uh, if we bring it up after the election, are you a yes on passage? And they, you know, yes. So, um, so I, it's vote counting. And the question is, do you want the political, uh, uh, you know, do you want to be Cudgel. able to say um, whose side everyone's on and have the political fodder uh, prior to the election? Or do you want the win? And I wanted the win. Um, I can't tell you how <laughs> how vehemently I feel felt about that because um, I was hearing from folks who weren't sleeping at night because they were so worried about um, uh, losing recognition of their um, of their marriages and you know so hard fought and 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 so yeah um, I wanted the win. Uh, there are times where I would say uh, uh, that I you know let's bring a bill up knowing that it's going to lose so we can show whose side people are on. Right. Um, but, uh, this wasn't one of them. And this, this must require you, like you must have trusted. I think one of the reasons that Tim, and by the way, what he meant to say in there was he's sorry for criticizing you. I may, may not have come. Did through. I say that? Meant, did I not say no. that? Did I not say the word sorry? That, did, that didn't quite come through, but mm. I just I thought want it was to make implied sure that... that I was wrong, but okay, yeah. go ahead. Thank you for clarifying. Uh, so you must have had faith that they were telling you the truth. Like that was sort of a leap of faith, right? And so have you built the kind of relationships with your colleagues in the Senate that you were sure that the yeses that they were giving you were real ones and not an attempt to just pull the carpet out from under you when it was after session? Um, so yes, I feel like with uh, some of the, the dozen that came, uh, uh, you know, came with us to pass this bill, um, that I, I have now a, a longer relationship. We've worked on all sorts of other legislation uh, together. And, um, I, you know, that when they give their word, they uh, they mean it. Um, I will tell you, with regard to this particular vote counting effort, um, a lot of folks uh, said what they said in the presence of other uh, supporters. So that, you know, the sort of key gang that was working on gathering the votes. And so uh, basically, um, as, as we were, uh, you know, we were moving towards a vote on bringing this to the floor before the election. And I was um, I was with several of the other uh, organizers on this bill. And my 
a couple of my Republican colleagues said, um, I'm a yes on the bill, but I'm not going to, uh, but not if it's before the election. And so it was witnessed by <laughs> more than just did you, me. <laughs> and did you, you didn't actually, did you slap any of them when they said that or want to like throw a, you know, hit, hit them in the face with a pie? There was no physical uh, uh, okay. violence uh, <laughs> involved. <laughs> No testing. But what about on in your mind? Did you, did you envision like that, that maybe so that what it would feel like? <laughs> I'll only support your marriage after the election. It's a it's an intriguing position. We appreciate your support, but it's a <laughs> it's an intriguing position for sure. Um, when Sarah and I were talking about this, you know, uh, uh, what we wanted to ask you, um, uh, she w said something to the effect of, you know, we should ask you about being a moderate Democrat, and I was like. It, uh, and then we were like, well, does she define herself as a moderate? And so I, I thought that it might just be interesting to hear your view on that, like where how, how you kind of define your politics these days is obviously the kind of rug is moved from under us a little bit in certain ways probably since you were first in politics. And I was kind of wondering how you define your kind of where you fit in the political system these days. That's interesting. So I, I use the word progressive a lot, um, but, you know, I. I don't know if you can see my back scenery here, but there's yeah. a little bobblehead right there. Yeah. That's fighting Bob LaFollette. He was <laughs> um, a senator at the turn of the last century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm in his Senate seat. He um, he was a Republican. He was elected as a Republican and then founded the progressive movement. Um, these words sort of changed in meaning over time, but I... Um, I I uh, am a, a sort of big uh, fan, if you will, of fighting Bob LaFollette. Uh, he was, in his time, um, a feminist. Uh, he was, uh, I, you know, stood up against the uh, the uh, monopolies of the day, the freight right. rail uh, 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 systems, and in fact, his first <laughs> his maiden speech in the Senate. You know, they make a big deal of the uh, maiden speech, and I. When I was about to give buying, I researched uh, many of the people who had, um, uh, you know, served Wisconsin before. What did they talk about in their maiden speech? Um, Fighting Pablo Follett, uh, his maiden speech was about uh, 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 regulating the freight rail, and it took place over three days. <laughs> when I gave buying, I said, I promise you, this will not take even an entire day, let alone three continuous days. But anyways, I, I, I define myself... Um, I, I because it means something in Wisconsin because it, Wisconsin was sort of the place where um, Republicans created the progressive movement, the uh, progressive party. Um, I I view myself as a progressive, uh, and um, I, and a lot of that has to do with um, uh, focus on um, uh, helping working people get ahead, and uh, uh, so. That's that's another yeah. aspect of my uh, of, of my politics. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons I think I got because I did say this to Tim, I was like, you know, she's I, I, I think of Wisconsin as I don't not just think about it. I know Wisconsin to be a place that doesn't always elect progressives. And so in my mind and, and maybe it's maybe a, a moderate temperament, because I think sometimes people can sort of read moderate and because they have a way of I think you emphasize your bipartisan nature um, you seem, I think you could tell me, but you seem like somebody that the Republicans would come potentially and seek out to talk to, to figure out how to work together. And, and so maybe that's how I'm thinking of it. But like, do you lean into that progressive? Cause you're about to, you're about to have a race. It's coming up. And, uh, do you, do you walk some of that back as you go into election mode? Or do you sort of trust that people see you for who you are in Wisconsin they like you, they know you, and they're going to go with you because they just feel like they can trust you and like you? Gosh, it's, it's so interesting. So, you know, this is um, the, the last time I was on the ballot was in 2018, the midterms. And so two years after. Um, Good year for you guys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I was uh, two, two years after President Trump was elected. And um, and I remember as I was traveling the state, um, uh, meeting my first Trump Baldwin voters, <laughs> and Sarah, I'm getting to an answer to your question. But it's sort of like, <laughs> okay, who who are these people, and uh, you know, that would vote for Donald Trump and then vote for Tammy Baldwin? And in many cases, it was 
um, you know, folks who had not felt really seen and heard, um, but hardworking folks who felt he saw them and felt I did. But I remember still to this day, this conversation with a guy who um, I was visiting his workplace. Um, I, he was a union, um, a union worker at a foundry. And he's like, sees me and he's like, why do you keep picking on my guy, Trump? And I'm like, what do you, you know, I was just taken aback. Why do you keep picking on Donald Trump, my guy? And I'm like, well, sometimes he deserves it. And maybe there's a little grin that he, he made, but not much. And, and anyways, and somebody comes up to him afterwards and says, you know, okay, so you're a big Trump fan. What do you think of Baldwin? And he's like, oh, she's got my vote. She supports Buy America policies. And I wouldn't have a job if there weren't uh, Buy America policies. Um, and, um, but that was an overlap between Donald Trump and Tammy Baldwin was, a, you know, both really focused on, on Buy America policies, which in a big manufacturing state and agriculture state like Wisconsin matters. And so in my mind, it's progressive policy, but, uh, but I would say, um, I, you know, that, that was something that people, uh, people saw it. I'm not saying there's a huge overlap, probably, uh, you know, 10%, um, but it matters. <laughs> no, it, it's crucial. And I, and I, I like to hear you say that because oftentimes when somebody says the word moderate and, and you're talking about what, who are the moderate voters you're trying to reach out to, you know, the, the first person that comes to mind in people's mind's eye is like the bulwark voter, right? It's a, it's a suburban, you know, kind of maybe socially, culturally, a little bit liberal, you know, but has some fiscal conservative sides, right? Like that's, uh, you know, the Im image in your head when you hear the word moderate, a lot of folks, but, but those, there may be even fewer of us, it's similar, but like there may be even fewer of us than there are the person you're talking about, right? Like the inverse moderate. And I, and I think there's certain Democrats that struggle at trying to reach out to the culturally conservative, economically liberal moderate, right? And, and I think the Democrats have lost a lot of ground with those voters, and they're very important in your state. And so I, how do you kind of manage would, that? You're thinking getting to those folks, but I also got to do a little better in the wow counties. You know, like, how do you right, how right. do you manage both of those types of voter? Yeah. And, and, and um, so let me let me start with um, another divide that you see in Wisconsin that's been written a lot about, especially post 2016, when Trump did win the state is an urban rural divide. And I think um, we've seen our rural counties become redder and redder. Uh, and, um, uh, but I think it's, it's one of those situations where showing up matters, seeing people, hearing people, respecting people, no matter where they live in the state. We're a rural state um, in, in so many regards, although we have a couple of bigger cities. Um, it, just a couple, right? And um, and so I think understanding that is is also key, not just understanding the Democrat Republican divide. Now going to the Wow counties, and I'm glad you mentioned the Wow counties uh, for those uh, folks who are uh, uh, tuned in. Um, those are the, the, what we call the three counties that sur surround Milwaukee County. So um, Washington County, Ozaukee County, Waukesha County. Um, are the uh, the wow counties. And um, we've seen some, uh, uh, they, they're deep red, uh, but they're becoming more purple, if you will. Um, and we saw that, especially in a nonpartisan race we just had um, for, uh, this was uh, uh, April 4th. Uh, these are nonpartisan, uh, uh, usually local, but there was one statewide race on the ballot, and that was for uh, an impending vacancy on our state Supreme Court. And the candidate who um, I think would be uh, uh, described as the progressive candidate in the field, um, Janet Protasewicz, uh, won with nearly an 11 point, uh, well, I think over an 11 point margin. And really in the wow counties, we saw um, a significant uh, depth of support there for her that we hadn't seen. Now, granted, she didn't have a, a D after her name and her opponent didn't have an R after his. But everybody knew this was about rights and freedoms and that um, since the Dobbs decision, when Wisconsin reverted to uh, being controlled by a law that was passed in 1849, and I did not misspeak, I meant 1849, our criminal abortion ban, 
um, th that has had a, a huge impact in Wisconsin. And people were voting their rights and freedoms and saying, I want, you know, we want our rights and freedoms back. And they connected the dots that a vote, a vote for Janet um, would be a vote uh, uh, to at least um, uh, have a prospect in the court of a fair decision in reviewing that, that law and several others. Um, so I have a question about your colleague, Mike Gallagher, or I guess he's not your colleague. He's in the, he's in Congress. Um, Mike Gallagher. Well, and if he represents uh, the part of the state that I okay. represent. So yeah, yeah so he's we your work colleague. together on things. So he's your colleague. Uh, and, yeah. and so Mike Gallagher is like, he's, he's always been my counter Republican. I love Lisa Mike Gallagher, uh, but he just took, I mean, I've been a little frustrated with him of late. He was somebody who, uh, you know, spoke out really strongly during the attack on the Capitol, but then didn't impeach Trump. And I was like, OK, he's positioning himself because he wants to run for Senate. He knows he can't vote to impeach Trump and then run for Senate. But he just took a pass on running, um, which is a trend in the Republican Party of people who are, uh, I think, pretty electable Republicans uh, at statewide levels. Uh, and you saw this with Sununu. You saw this with um uh, Larry Hogan, people who just said, I'm not going to run for Senate because he didn't say why. But I suspect that's something to do with the current uh, the Republican primary. The current problem, yeah, the current problem in a Republican primary with the Republican Party. Uh, but are you were you relieved uh, that he wasn't running or were you because <laughs> he would have been formidable? Or do you think he couldn't have gotten through a Republican? Do some rank punditry with me. Do you think he couldn't? Yeah, have pundit with <laughs> us on Mike Gallagher. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so let me start with the point you were first making is um, when there are only two statewide races on the ballot, as there are next year in Wisconsin, the presidency and this U.S. Senate seat, um, I would imagine anybody eyeing getting into the Republican primary to run for U.S. Senate is wondering who is going to be the presidential nominee, right? And if you're, um, if you're full MAGA, um, that's going to be an attractive uh, sort of uh, thing, right? Uh, oh, I'll run for U.S. Senate, and I can share the stage with Donald Trump. We're have we, you know we're hosting the Republican National Convention yep. next year in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, it's very clear that there's a big uh, target on on uh, trying to win back Wisconsin um, for the the National Republicans. And so I've just got to thank anybody who's thinking about getting into um, into the race is, uh, is is realizing how closely tied their fortunes will be to that Republican nominee for president. Uh, I you know, but um, but back to uh, to Mike Gallagher, uh, you know, I, it, he has been somebody who um, I've been able to uh, work with. I think very um, constructively on. Um, uh, especially issues within his district. He represents a district with, um, you know, uh, on, on Lake Michigan that has um, a shipyard. Um, he's, a, he's on the House Armed Services Committee. I'm on the uh, Appropriations Defense Subcommittee. Uh, so making sure that uh, they keep on building ships for the Navy has been a, uh, a, 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 an effort that we've paired up on occasionally uh, when necessary. And um, I, I would say there's any number of, uh, of sort of parochial issues that affect uh, his congressional district and the state that I represent, um, where it's, it's good to be able to work together. What, what about the China Select Committee? What's your, what's your take on that? Um, so certainly it, what a plum assignment for him. And uh, I think he's, uh, he's doing uh, a good job. Um, I think I'm glad that the House is paying attention to issues. Uh, uh, I, I have been sort of on that, uh, on that, with that focus for a long time. Um, when I was in the House of Representatives, I was one of the ones who voted against permanent uh, uh, normalized trade relations with China, PNT. Um, and I, I, so, so I have a long history on doing this, but I'm glad that there's more focused attention um, we got to get it right. I I don't want the tensions to become so high that we're uh, it, it, that uh, they're dangerous. But I do think we have to be uh, eyes wide open with the fact that 
um, in, in economic competition, there is not a level playing field. And yeah. it, for a state mm. like Wisconsin has meant um, a, a lot of job loss um, because uh, they can either dump product in the U.S. Uh, uh, and, and drive folks out of business or uh, that uh, multinational businesses have actually just moved the jobs from, from Wisconsin to China. And so, uh, you know, it's something that we need to be on top of. I got to ask you about one more issue about, uh, you know, issues that are coming from the left um, since we have you. I mean, I think that if you look at Mandela's loss, um, I think there are a lot of explanations for it. Um, you know, maybe resources. And, uh, you know, uh, I think there are a lot of, you know, as you go out of being very close. Uh, but one that really stuck out is, you know, essentially what happened in Kenosha. You see his numbers that go down. I think that you have a, uh, in that air part of the state. You know, you had what was really wrong, like the, you know, uh, obviously the police behavior was wrong, but the rioting and and the treatment of local businesses and stuff was wrong. And I think that a lot of Democrats, you know, maybe 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 progressive activists more than Democrats got a little bit out over their skis on not speaking clearly, you know, about that those riots and and you know wanting to make sure that okay, even if we have concerns about police brutality. You know, there are certain things that we can't be doing to our fellow members of our state. I'm just wondering how you see that issue and, you know, whether, because obviously I think that's going to be something they come out with you on uh, just like they did Mandela. Yeah. So um, I, I, I it, speaking with clarity is very important. Um, and I, you know, condemning violence, uh, condemning, I, uh, I, uh, the, the type of you know looting and destruction that took place is uh, is important um, as is and again to be really clear on an issue as is um, uh, it, it important to talk about um, uh, the the type of uh, instances that we were seeing too uh, far too often whether it was George Floyd or um, uh, you know the the uh, uh, what, what was unfolding, frankly, across the country with disturbing frequency. And I think you have to, um, you have to be able to take each separately. Um, obviously, there's a right to protest. There's a right to uh, uh, speak out. Um, but it does not entail um, uh, violence and looting and uh, the sort of thing we saw in Kenosha. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we've seen too much. Uh, of this uh, as a country, you know, whether it's that or, or you know, what we saw on January 6th. Um, yeah. There's there's no place uh, uh, for um, for things uh, going beyond um, the, the articulation of, uh, uh, you know, of one's grievances. Uh, now, um, let me also just add uh, that I'm I would point to different set of factors that uh, uh, in that U.S. Senate race. Um, okay. uh, you know, I know there's a, a, a number of folks who were saying this was about uh, issues. Um, I think given how close that race was, one of the uh, things that happened in the closing weeks was um, publication of some um, public polls that were just way off. And uh, if you have a couple of Newspapers saying, uh, you know, in Wisconsin, uh, he's going to lose by ten. He's down six or seven points, and you're deciding, um, you know, where you're going to write your last check. Uh, is it going to be for John Fetterman? Is it going to be for Raphael Warnock? Is it going to be for Catherine Cortez Masto? And 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 the, so and and the newspapers, I think, uh, after the fact, and it's sadly after the fact, said, yeah, we 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 got it wrong. We we published some polls that just weren't accurate in the end. And uh, it took a lot of wind out of the sails. And so I think that uh, actually played a, a pretty prominent role, especially given how close it actually was. Sarah, Senator Bolin's got to do some real senatoring and we got to get to our rapid fire. It's the fun weekend podcast. So do you have fi a final question for any other burning things you've been wanting to hear before we get to the rapid fire? No, I just want to say that was A plus punditing. Uh, and uh, I, I learned some things. You have a I career in our business if yeah. it goes wrong. Oh, no, next I November. don't. I promise you I don't. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm going to I'm just going to ask a, a little question, which is uh, I, I'm I'm pretty uh, 
as somebody who wanted to run for political office, but actually thought I couldn't run as an out lesbian Republican, um, I'm pretty inspired by the fact that you like went for it at a time where uh, it seemed like maybe it wouldn't happen for you. So like, what advice do you give people who want to get into politics, um, but, you know, aren't sure if they should do it for one reason or another? Well, it's certainly uh, anything I can say to uh, get rid of those anxieties and inhibitions. But uh, so, um, you know, what I did, uh, and, and I got started very early on. I was 24 when I was sworn on to, sworn into the county board. But um, I just sort of dove in in terms of volunteering on other people's campaigns. And, uh, you know, while I had studied government in college and got my degree, double, double major in mathematics and government, uh, but I studied it. It's it, it, it. There's no substitute for just getting getting in there. And so, um, so I was doing doors for other people, sort of getting the feel of what it, it feels like to engage with voters. I was, um, I you know, helping a few candidates for local office organize their campaigns. They were pretty new at it too, and sort of, uh, and and just, um, and I, as you know from my. Um, background. I started at super local politics, um, and not necessarily with a, a, a view that someday I was going to be in much higher office, um, uh, but was encouraged to take that step ladder approach. So county board, state assembly. So my first constituency on the county board, ten thousand people. I I represented fifty thousand people when I was in the state assembly. Seven hundred thousand when I was in the uh, uh, you know in the House of Representatives. Um, but just dive in, and maybe you start by working on other people's campaigns, just to to demystify it, to understand how you know how it works. Um, and I think also I would say you know I've I've read a lot uh, and and you know as a woman in politics I get some of this innately, but um, a lot of women also doubt their mastery of the issues and will often not dive in because they don't know everything yet. <laughs> it was like, well, I'll, I'll wait until I've studied everything that could come before the Dane County Board of Supervisors. You know, and sometimes our guy, our, our male counterparts just, you know, oh, I'll wing it. I'll be fine. <laughs> So, so I would also, as a as a young woman, say you do not have to know everything. You have to understand your core set of values, and then just go for it. <laughs> that is great advice. Okay, we're moving to the rapid fire round. We're running out of time. Are you ready, Senator Baldwin? The first one. Everyone gets it. Something you've changed your mind on since entering politics. Oh gosh, there's so many. Um, there was a a, a local issue. Um, I. I opposed uh, building the um, Frank Lloyd Wright designed um, uh, 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 convention center in downtown Madison. Um, it was in my uh, it was in my district. I actually ran on we can't have it. It is the most beautiful uh, uh, building in 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 downtown Madison, except for the Capitol. <laughs> yeah. Now, that's a so, that's sometimes public investment is good. Okay, Re Obama famously said that you drink a beer with Mitch McConnell if you if you want bipartisanship so much. So, what is a Republican senator that you would most like to drink beers with? I know you're a beer a beer drinker. I I am. You have to support your uh, Wisconsin businesses. Um, uh, oh boy. Um, uh, just Tom Tillis. Everybody picks Tom Tillis. He must be a nice guy. He's fine. I think Chris Murphy also picked Tom Tillis. Okay. Um, <laughs> I El can pick uh, another I, one I, if you don't want, you know, uh, Dan Sullivan. <laughs> Dan Sullivan. Um, that He seems like a guy to drink a beer with. Um, I have some complaints, but we'll get to that in another episode. Okay. Your L we're, it's Gay Pride Month. Your LGBTQ American Mount Rushmore. I need four LGBTQ Americans to put on Mount Rushmore. Ready. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Harvey Milk. Uh, uh, Elaine Noble. Um, this is why I do this Barney so I can Google Frank. people. <laughs> Who is the third one? Barney Frank. <laughs> oh, Barney Frank. Um, Steve Gunderson, a Wisconsinite. That's a good pick for local bias. I'll have to say, this is no shame on you. This is like the third or fourth person I've asked this. 
Someone commented, "No one has yet said James Baldwin. That is a that is horrible, and that I it's my fault, not yours. I I didn't put him on mine either, so I'm kicking Harvey Milk off mine. He's he did a great job, but James Baldwin's got to be on there. Okay, your most stereotypically lesbian personality trait. Chris, um, do you wear fingerless gloves? Do you like to chop wood? Oh, is, I like uh, power tools. I power do, tools. I, power you like tools. Power tools. Sure. Great one. Okay, final question for if. People want to come to Wisconsin. We hear about Madison. You hear about Lambeau Field. What is a town, restaurant, park in Wisconsin that people don't know about that we should come visit? Oh, yeah. Hike the Ice Age Trail. I, I don't even know what that is. That's a good Google. Hiking the Ice Age Trail. That's that's also maybe a stereotypically lesbian trait. Okay. <laughs> Final bonus when we're out of time. Who do you want to run against next year and why is it Sheriff David Clark? <laughs> Oh gosh. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, wow. I, I, they, they get to sort that out themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for the time, Senator Baldwin. Uh, <laughs> this is really great to have you. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have other stuff that's relevant for the bulwarky wow crowd audience, you know, tell the staff to keep in touch. And, um, I did not get to the fact that you are currently working on a buy American or label American bill with JD Vance. So Go maybe online. it, yeah, cool. maybe it's cool, online. cool online. Um, Country of origin labeling online. This is your bipartisan cred. You're so bipartisan, you'll even work with JD Vance. So um, we appreciate you for doing that and for coming on the show. And uh, we'll talk to you soon.